Hi there guys, uh, today's lesson is going to be on the October Revolution. Essentially we're going to be looking at three main things. We're going to be looking at the causes of the revolution itself um, and you know what was leading up to it, what made it possible. We're also going to look at the process itself of um, what actually happened and who was involved. And lastly we're going to look at the, um, the opposition that the uh, revolution faced um, and the Bolsheviks once they seized power. So those are the three things that we're going to focus on in today's lesson. So while there are plenty of key causes um, in this 1917 October Revolution, of course we've got the February Revolution itself, um, the the dual authority with, between the Provisional Government and the Petrograd Soviet, um, and the breakdown of those sort of um, dynamics there, uh, one of the key causes that happens just before uh, the October Revolution is the Kornilov Affair. So we're going to take a quick look at that and just recap what actually happened um, and look at how that really influenced um, the the possibility of, an, of a Bolshevik takeover. So essentially uh, Kerensky had manipulated Kornilov to think that there had been a coup in Petrograd or at least that, that it was likely or possible um, and Kornilov took the bait uh, by becoming Kerensky's sort of counter-revolutionary force um, that was easily crushed by the Prime Minister himself, Kerensky, um, and his forces, and it really cemented the respect of the Bolsheviks for Kerensky. That's what, he'd, that's what he hoped would happen, but we know that that's really not the case. Um, while it did disgrace Kornilov, um, and he sort of fell out of popularity and power, uh, it didn't have the desired effect for Kerensky himself. Uh, so the Prime Minister, he didn't become a hero, he didn't become a sort of leader of the Bolsheviks and sort of tame them down a little bit. Um, instead, he actually became someone who showed poor communication, poor decision making, um, and there was also an accusation against him now of being really underhanded and manipulative and basically trying to start all of these plots to sort of cement his own power, which is, um, you know, an, in an increasingly democratic and uh, worker-led, Soviet-led uh, city and country, that's not something that you want to be painted as. Um, so, most of all, one of the outcomes against Kerensky was that it made him look like he depended far too heavily on the Bolshevik forces to stop this attack. Um, he was trying to win the favour of the Bolsheviks and sort of tame them a little bit um, and use them and sort of force that cooperation. But really, it just sort of proved that um, his provisional government was weak or useless um, if it didn't actually have the Soviet or the uh, representative of the Soviet behind them, which is the Petrograd garrisons and the Red Guard and all that sort of stuff. Um, so people are realising, well, the Bolsheviks and these revolutionaries are more powerful than the leader of the provisional government. So when we look at the outcomes for the Bolsheviks themselves, uh, for the Bolsheviks, the Kornilov affair was exactly what they needed. We know that from the July days, they'd ruined their reputation, um, trying to do that sort of um, really quick coup d'etat, really unorganised, uh, and they they failed, essentially. Um, and they looked pretty poorly on um, after that, um, even though they were still growing in momentum and popularity while other parties were a little bit in, in flux at the time. Um, it sort of put a bit of a stain on them and made them look a little bit too power hungry. Um, so the Russian armed forces, they also lost faith in Kerensky and they put their faith in the Bolsheviks because they were the ones that were able to uh, um, protect the city, right, and protect the Soviet. Um, so Kerensky was the one that actually put all of the guns in their hands um, and armed them and, and sort of organised them more than they really had ever had the opportunity to. So the Bolsheviks came out of the Kornilov affair, one, looking like heroes, but two, being armed militants, right? Ready to um, to take action if they ever needed to again, or to protect the city if, if ever they perceived a threat again. So they really, really seized that opportunity very well and then came out of it looking very good, whereas Kerensky came out of it looking pretty poor. Um, and of course, Kornilov was done. He was out of the picture. Over the course of August to September, throughout the nation, it seemed that voters had become really disenchanted or apathetic, so not really caring uh, about politics, right? So the voter turnout was dropping for the elections, um, participations by the deputies themselves, so those elected officials in the Petrograd Soviet, they were feeling a little bit blocked, they were feeling a bit, a bit like um, they didn't really have as much influence or they, were, they had reached a sort of stalemate on most of these big issues. They were waiting for this next constituent assembly to have some sort of defining change. Um, so everyone sort of was in this just um, this period where there was not really a lot happening and they felt pretty uh, pretty useless. Um, whereas um, the the Bolsheviks themselves, they didn't take their foot off the gas. They, they kept themselves um, very much 
uh, energetic and, and making sure that they had a really consistent, hard message of their, their left socialism and their radical idea that only a working class, not just a not just a sort of simple change, but only a working class uprising and overthrow of the provisional government uh, could actually make um, this the change that was needed for, for Russia. Uh, whereas a lot of the other parties, they were changing a lot. Um, many, many deputies were actually leaving parties like the Mensheviks, for example, Trotsky, um, leaving the Mensheviks and the SR and all that sort of stuff to join the Bolsheviks themselves, not just because they agreed with their policies, um, but because they had a clear view clear vision and um many of the other parties didn't at the time they were changing a lot their leaders were in and out uh they started on the left and moved far to the the moderate or the right side of these issues um and they were yeah they were feeling very disenchanted with what was on offer um and so were many voters so the bolsheviks um gave that opportunity for people to have an alternative um some historians have argued that the bolsheviks rise in popularity was the result of a consistent party line um as I said, that was lacking by other major parties. Historian Rex Wade has said that the Bolsheviks became the alternative for the disappointed and the disenchanted, which really sums up what was going on with these other parties at the time and with the voters, right? That, that rise in apathy, they either felt unheard or just didn't care anymore, whereas the Bolsheviks represented something very real and something very fierce. So they wanted to follow that. They wanted to sort of um, go where the passion was and the Bolsheviks had it. They were the only ones left with any steam. So you can see here in this graphic, we've got a short table of the uh, municipal elections in Moscow. Um, these are the percentage of seats. So if you look at the change from June to September, you can see a really radical shift. We know that the socialist revolutionaries lost a lot of uh, power. Um, originally a pretty left-wing party, but during this process, during 1917, you start to have a lot of them move a little bit more to the middle or some even to the right. Um, and so they're becoming less popular, particularly with the working people uh, inside the Soviets. Um, you've got the Mensheviks losing a little bit of popularity, 8% there, whereas the Bolsheviks rising almost 40% in their seat percentage and the cadets rising a little bit as well. In history, we often like to simplify things and put them all in a straight line and say that these were all part of this grand plan, for example, the Bolshevik takeover. Um, so they needed this, 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 and this to happen, and that's what they made happen. Um, but in reality, there's also in history called the theory of accident, the fact that um, while all of these things are connected and, and the parties and the people themselves do have a lot of influence, um, these perfect moments in time happen because certain things are happening simultaneously or happening to give them that opportunity. And we really do see that with the October Revolution, simply in the fact that Kerensky um, tries to manipulate things to his advantage, but really he, out of pure accident or pure mistake, he creates the perfect opportunity for the Bolsheviks to take over. He gives them that excuse um, and knows they know that they will get the support of the Soviet and the people um, in response to what he's done. Um, so we really do have the perfect storm. Uh, we know that in 1917, the Bolsheviks have started to gain a lot of momentum. They're sort of recovering from their July day failed coup. Um, we know that since its inception, the provisional government have been declining in their popularity. They were never elected. They were always going to be second to the uh, Petrograd Soviet. Um, the prime minister himself continues to lose popularity, particularly after his uh, failed manipulation of the Kornilov affair. He pretty much uh, set up Kornilov to fail, but at the same time, people people weren't stupid. They they got wise to that and saw that he was a uh, trying to be a bit of a puppet master, but he sort of failed there. Um, and lastly, the Bolsheviks emerged from those affairs, uh, largely being organized, um, having the arms that they needed, and looking like the heroes that the revolution really needed. Um, so not only to keep it afloat, but to make that lasting change that everyone was waiting for, that everyone was sort of holding their breath for and waiting for. So another thing that acts in support of the Bolshevik cause and this, this idea of the perfect storm is that even though Lenin didn't believe that the peasants were in, incredibly important in terms of his revolution, you know, he'd always thought that um, this this socialist communist revolutionary change could only happen through the the rising up of a working class led by maybe an intelligentsia but the peasants what do they know they can they'll benefit from this but they're not really the leaders um it was still the perfect storm in the sense that the peasants themselves had been contributing to this revolutionary hiatus or this inability of the provisional government to really 
control anything. Um, in the countryside, we know well, we know that peasants make up 82% of the Russian population, but in the countryside since uh, late 1916, they've really been disrupting uh, all form of government out in the country. They had been seizing land, burning down manors, basically repeating the uprisings and peasant re revolt of 1905-06. They'd been doing the same things again in 1917, um, and the government couldn't do anything about it. The provisional government was weak. We had a war going on. Um, we don't have the troops to go and stamp this out. And really, it's at, a, it's at a time where the Soviets are in control. What they feel is that the workers and the people are in control. So even though Lenin doesn't necessarily talk about the peasants very much, he still makes his universal promise. That's peace, bread, and land. Well, that sounds like three things that everyone uh, really stands for, but at the same time, something that really is close to the heart of the peasants. So we've got peace. Well, we know that during the war, uh, you know, a large amount of our, the Russian troops are made up of peasants, or conscripts at least are made up of peasants sort of forced to go off, fight in a war they don't care about, uh, and die. Um, meanwhile, making uh, peasant labour uh, decline. So it's a really, um, really poor cycle going on there for the peasants. So they're, of course, against the war. Um, of course, we're all, <laughs> Lenin's also promising bread. Okay, the fact that uh, food and the availability of food, uh, we know that for the war effort, the government had been going around and requisitioning grain or requisitioning all sorts of um, resources. So stealing things off the peasants and saying, sorry, we need this for the government, um, which is ironic considering what we know is about to come up in the uh, post-revolution stage. Um, you know, particularly once, it, once we get to collectivization and then Stalinism. Um, and of course, he's promising land to them. Well, peasants care for one thing above all, and that's that's land. The ability to survive them themselves without having an authority over them, kick them off, rent them out, all that sort of thing. Um, and also the ability to hopefully make a little bit of a profit. Um, so again, so these are the promises that Lenin's making to them. Peace, bread, land. It's very simple. And the peasants support that cause. Therefore, they, they, they're not going to put up too much of a fight when Lenin comes into power. They might not have, not have voted for him. Uh, but really, um, their uprising in the country has debilitated the provisional government. So it in turn supports the, um, the Bolshevik takeover when they want to. They've... Um, they've really created a bit of a stalemate in the country. So on the 7th of October, we have the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks um, meeting together with Lenin and he's uh, denouncing those within the party that are saying, well, no, we need to not do, an, not do an overthrow, don't take over the government, let's just wait for the Constituent Assembly to happen in a couple of months because um, then we'll be voted in and we'll be a legitimate government and then we can make the changes that we need. We can be as radical as we want to, but at least we'll have the... Um, the legal backing of the people, so we'll have both the authority and the power. Um, whereas Lenin says, well, no, we've got our perfect storm right now. We can't wait. We've got all of these things going for us. And he, he says out loud, history will not forgive us if we do not take power now. Um, so they, he feels that, well, if we wait too long, we won't get this opportunity. We'll miss it and the world will be worse for it, or at least Russia will be worse for it. Um as I was saying before, you know, the, the, the peasant uprising contributed to this as well. Like we have this stalemate going on at the time. Um, we have this non-governance out in the country. And, you know, we've got the working people supporting the Soviets um, more than ever before, hating on the provisional government. And we've also got the war closing. So Russia is either going to leave the war soon, Lenin feels, or um, the war itself will be ending soon, which... Both were true, um, but he realised the one of the largest uh, sources of energy and anger for the Russian people was the war. And if we take that away and we solve that war problem, we might not have that fuel or that energy that we need uh, to get them to believe in us when we take over. Um, and when we end the war on day one, you know. So he's saying we can't risk a coalition, a coalition government. So he's also saying, we can't risk a coalition government. Many are saying, okay, well, um, if we take over, let's make sure that we are working with the other socialist powers because we don't want to be dictators. We don't want to just go in there and then immediately be overthrown ourselves. We want to make sure that we've got some sort of a, an agreement on the left. Um, so let's work with the SR. Let's work with uh, the Mensheviks, for example. Um, but Lenin says, no. Only the Bolsheviks have the ability to govern effectively. Only a Bolshevik revolution will do it right. So 
he's a little bit close-minded there and um, he might pay for it in the end. So in the end, they do come to an agreement. On the 10th of October, the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks meet together. Lenin proposes his idea of an insurrection. And uh, even though there are a few naysayers that disagree with it, um, mostly they all agree that we are going to have our revolution. We are going to have our insurrection. It just depends on how and when exactly. Um, Trotsky essentially comes up with a very clever solution to it all. He says, well, in a few weeks, we have the uh, second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Um which is an enormous, you know, national meeting of all the Soviets from, uh, or leaders from all the Soviets around the nation. Um, the first one happened in June and the Bolsheviks kind of got laughed at because Lenin sort of stood up and says, yeah, well, we'll take charge. And everyone sort of laughed him out of the room a little bit. They just, they didn't take them too seriously. Um, and that was just before the, the July days as well. Um, whereas Trotsky says, okay, we've got this second, uh, second Congress coming up. Uh, if we plan our insurrection for around that time, maybe just before, um, maybe the day before, right? Uh, when we take over, it will also look like, and we'll present it to the Congress, um, they'll support us. And if we have the support of that Congress of the Soviets, um, we will have the support of the people because it's all about all power to the Soviets. Um, they're the, you know, the Bolsheviks have been arguing forever that the government should be led by the Soviets. Um, but in reality, um, it turns out that they want it to be run by the Bolsheviks with Soviet support. Um, so Lenin agrees to that. And that's that day that cements their decision. We are going to take over in two weeks time. Um, historian Richard Pipes argues that the purpose of this obviously was to, as I said, legitimize uh, the the taking over of the government because if you did it without the authority of the Soviets and the uh, the Congress, um, you could probably be you know forced out the next day. They they had a large force, but they really depended on the uh, backing of the Soviets and the people. So Lenin later said said if we seize power today, we seize it not in opposition to the Soviets, but on their behalf. So we're doing this for you and really uh, under your authority. So in comes. Our master of puppets, Kerensky, he really thinks he's a puppet master, but really uh, he's a little bit more of a Muppet. Um, so he realizes, okay, the Bolsheviks pose a real threat. I cooperated with them uh, during the Kornilov affair to try and, um, you know, create, tame them a little bit and sort of make them work for me. That's not really happening. I feel that there's going to be a, a, a coup. And he's right, there is going to be a coup. So what he tries to do is lure them out earlier than they're ready for. Um, so what he does is he orders the Petrogr part of the Petrograd garrison to go to the war front. So this has a few effects in Kerensky's mind that sort of uh, weakens Petrograd a little bit, gets rid of some of those Bolshevik sympathizers within the Petrograd, Soviet, uh, Petrograd garrison that represent the Soviet. Um, and it also m hopefully makes the... Uh, the Bolsheviks, you know, jump into jump into it and launch their coup early, going, aha, the city's a little bit undefended, let's go for it. Um, whereas Len Lenin reads right through that, the uh, the garrison read right through that, they refuse to cooperate with the uh, with the orders, and they say, no, we're staying right here, and also, how dare you? Lenin basically says, okay, well, um, you're trying to, he accuses Kerensky, he says, you're trying to weaken Russia, you're trying to re weaken Petrograd itself, and make it vulnerable both to an invasion by the German army, but also uh, basically weaken it in case you want to take control and overpower the will of the Soviets, or really overpower the uh, uh, Soviet, or the uh, Petrograd garrison, and also the uh, the Red Guard formed by the Bolsheviks. Um, so it really doesn't look good for Kerensky. He really makes another fatal mistake. Um, trying to sort of control the whole thing as, you know, everyone's his little puppet. He's been in the job for, you know, only, what, two, three months at this point. Uh, and anytime he makes a big decision, he makes the wrong one. And he's trying to have too much control over over what's going on. Um, so he doesn't look very good in the end. So the Bolshevik response to this and the garrison response and the Petrograd Soviet response to this is to essentially go, well, stop right there, Kerensky. Uh, you might be the prime minister, but we're going to have to defend ourselves from you, and we're not taking your bait. Uh, instead, w the uh, the Petrograd Soviet elect a military revolutionary committee, or the Mirovkom, as they're called later, uh, made up of only five people. It's three Bolsheviks, including Trotsky, and two socialist revolutionaries, to sort of even the balance there of the socialists. Um, and it really, it existed essentially just to both protect 
Petrograd from German invasion, so it sort of organises the forces in case of an invasion, but also against any uh, counter-revolutionary attacks by the government itself. Um, so you're seeing like almost a civil war here between the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet or the Petrograd garrison. Um, so you're getting the Bolsheviks um, essentially leading this um, this uh, defense against counter-revolutionary -re uh, troops that don't really come. So, as if Kerensky hadn't made enough mistakes, he makes his third final fatal mistake uh, only a few days, or one or two days really, before the October Revolution. He can smell it in the air, he might have an informer that's saying, okay, uh, it's absolutely happening just before this Congress happens. Um, so, he needs to do something to stamp it out. And, you know, that's his position. His job is to stop uh, his government being overthrown. Um, so, what he decides to do is, okay, well, we're going to have to take control of the city with our national troops, um, but we need to stop the urban workers and the and the garrison and the Bolsheviks from coming in and um, and sort of messing up our plans. So the first thing that they do is they raise all of the bridges um, that are sort of used to separate the sort of urban working class areas from the main part of the city itself. So that sort of busy city business centre, if you like. Um, so they close that off and prevent access to them. Uh, and they also go around really quickly to try and close down any Bolshevik presses to stop all of this getting out and to sort of uh, stop them, you know, disseminating their, their radical ideas in support of an insurrection. Um, and lastly, they try to arrest many Bolshevik leaders and also the Milrevkom leaders. Uh, so those responsible for protecting the garrison and protecting Petrograd and the Soviet from this national effort by the provisional government to to destroy the revolution, um, so they made a he made a fatal mistake there, um, and that basically gives the Milrevkom their excuse to act because they declared days before, if you prime minister or or the provisional government or any troops on behalf of you threaten uh, the Soviet or the revolution, uh, we will be forced to act. Well, he puts his foot forward, and so do they. So. Here's the response. So the Reds respond um, immediately. Trotsky basically rallies the Petrograd Soviet um, and its representatives and say, well, we need to defend the Soviet. We need to defend the city uh, from Kerensky's attack. Um, he has violated the decree that we just made the other day. Right? We said, if you put your foot forward, uh, we will put ours, and this is what's going to happen. Uh, on the 24th of October, so immediately the next day, the Bolsheviks go around and ca recapture many of their presses and start printing out their magazines and pamphlets really quickly to uh, spread the word. Um, armed soldiers, sailors, and workers flood back into the cities, so they, you know, the bridges sort of come back down and they, they, they flood in and try to control the streets. Uh, they capture key government buildings. Um, and what's interesting is, even though the provisional government still has very many loyal troops, they realise that it's futile resisting this enormous crowd of people. Um, so many either just sort of walk away, um, take it easy for the rest of the day, or uh, surrender themselves to the, uh, to the revolutionary troops. Um, so the Reds or the Bolsheviks and, and the garrisons also took control of all communications, train stations, electricity, telegraph station, post stations, all that sort of stuff, even uh, one of the state banks. Um, so they're really controlling all the key points in town that you would need uh, to stop any uh, any national response or, or governmental response. Um, so they effectively had taken control of most of the city except for the... Uh, Winter Palace itself, which is where the provisional government operate out of. Um, and on this day, Lenin leaves his hideout to go and lead his people uh, and lead this revolution. He'd been doing most of it from afar, made a few appearances, doing a lot of his leading uh, by newspaper or by secret meetings and speeches and things like that. Um, this is really one of the first times where he stands up and actually um, takes action. Um, and it has a really electrifying effect. So on the 25th of October, this is when the October Revolution really kicks off. This is the seizing of the Winter Palace sort of overnight. Uh, Lenin rocks up, takes control, and some say that it's immediately electrifying and that people, you know, are shouting. For example, the, uh, the leader of the assault of Senko says, To work! Our leader is with us! Full speed ahead! Um, so he has this electrifying effect or energetic effect on all the people. So they had taken over, they had controlled certain points, but he says, no, 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 we're not done yet. Full steam ahead. Let's get this going. Um, and I'm here with you, which is an amazing moment because most people had not really seen Lenin yet. They 
They, they loved him and they loved his policy and they loved all of his speeches and what he stood for. But most of these, most of these soldiers or urban workers hadn't really had a chance to uh, see him in person. So it was kind of like, you know, their God descending and coming down as one of the people to be with them in this, in this moment of glory. And that's what inspired them, right? Oh, this must be real, what's happening right now, um, because Lenin's here. So let's do this. So they get really excited and um, they assault the palace. As electrifying as Lenin's leadership is, it's still a very amateur production. Um, they failed their coup in July, and it's pretty easy to see why when you look at this. They have a much larger force now. They try to engage a mixture of the navy and, and their, their soldiers and the garrisons and the, the Reds all themselves. They've got all the weapons. They thought they had all the organization. Um, and they really, they really are pretty disorganized or a lot of things go wrong and it really looks like a bit of a mess and you've got Lenin ends up pacing back and forth for hours going, let's get our, you know, let's get our crap together. Uh, we're, we're trying to over overthrow this palace here. Um, and things just aren't going right for him. Um, for example, we have, um, people trying to take over the, uh, Peter and Paul, um, cannons, uh, that was initially going to be the site of the first signal of the assault. So what we were going to do was uh, get a red lantern. That was the agreed upon signal. We're going to hoist it above those cannons um, and that'll be the, that's the go, right? Um, big problem was that they couldn't find a red lantern. They sort of just made it up on the day and went, okay, well, well where do we get a red lantern? Uh, the person responsible for, okay, where, where's a red lantern? Goes out looking for it, supposedly uh, falls in a ditch somewhere and gets lost. Um, and eventually finds a purple flare. That's the best they can do. So we'll launch up a purple flare a lot later than we planned on. Uh, the, the cannons that they had tried to capture because they face the Winter Palace, uh, those cannons themselves were pretty much antiques. They were all rusted and, and old and regal looking. Um, so they realized they were close to useless. So their quick response was, okay, we know where there's some other cannons. So they went, captured some other cannons, ready to go. Wait, we've got nothing to fire out of these cannons. They didn't have the shells to work with those cannons. Um, so it's it's almost as if they came up with this insurrection, uh, you know, the day of. Um, they didn't really do their homework. They didn't really plan it out. Um, another signal that was supposed to happen at the same time as the Red Lantern was also using a cruise ship or a cruiser, the Aurora. Um, so using the Navy and the sailors that were allied with the Bolsheviks to fire a few warning shots at the Winter Palace. Um, that took a few hours because they were a little bit late. And so when they finally fired, um, things were already sort of underway. Um, so, yeah, it was a real ragtag mess. But when you look at the Winter Palace themselves, they weren't very much better organized. They'd sort of barricaded all the doors. Um, but as soon as the first big shots were fired, even though there was very little damage, um, the reports say that, you know, they were hiding under desks, um, you know, because many of the troops guarding the, the uh, Winter Palace had been there for hours and hours and hours waiting for this attack. They thought, oh, well, maybe I've got a little bit of time. Many of them just left for lunch, according to anecdotal accounts. Uh, they said, all right, well, we're just we're going to head off and grab a little bit of a bite, go get some dinner. Um, and then, yeah, during that process, it took hours and hours and hours to finally take over the Winter Palace, not because it was a big bloody affair. There were only a couple of hundred people in the building or at least a couple of hundred troops, um, but essentially because uh, it's an enormous place. It took them hours just to track down the last of the uh, provisional government representatives, so those ministers, um, hiding under tables and in cabinets and things like that. So it wasn't until about 2.10 a.m. that they finally captured the last one of them and said, all right, you're under arrest. Have we got all of them? Okay, cool, and declared their victory. So the overthrow of the Winter Palace or the seizing of the Winter Palace takes hours and hours, something like uh, five and a half hours or so, four and a half hours, um, which is a long time to capture one building that's really not putting up a fight, doesn't really have a, a lot of people defending them. Uh, half of them either, uh, you know, war amputees or a, um, a, a women's guard who, according to anecdotal sources, became hysterical straight away. Um, again, it's hard to know what to believe from accounts like that. Um, but really, there wasn't an enormous effort to defend the palace. It just took a very long time because it was an enormous place. Um, and, you know, having a decisive victory took a lot of searching and a lot of rooms and that sort of thing. So uh, the problem is, so that that's 2.10 a.m. that they finally declare their victory. Um, but around, you know, uh, we know that the uh, all-Russian Congress of Soviets 
had already been going on for a few hours at that time. And by one o'clock, they were learning of the events uh, going on at the Winter Palace and throughout the city and the Bolshevik takeover. Um, and they'd pretty much denounced it. Um, all of the socialist rev revolutionaries, the Mensheviks, the cadets, all of them just said flat out, no, we reject what's happening and we do not see this as a legitimate takeover. You're using force when we had all agreed upon an election in a couple of months. Um, that's the avenue that we're all working towards, a democracy, not a dictatorship. We're the strongest rule. Um, so they all denounce it. The problem is at, at one o'clock in the morning, uh, they're all saying, okay, we denounce this revolution. Trotsky stands up and says, well, you know, we're, we're taking it whether you like it or not, and we refuse to form any coalition because some of the socialist rev revolutionaries and Mensheviks say, well, you know, okay, you, you've seized power, but how about we do this together as, as socialists, so we'll, we'll sort of form this, this co-government together. And they said, no, nah, we already tried this co-government, this dual authority, we refuse to share power. Um, this is how it's going to be. Trotsky's very firm on this, and they all... They all walk out. The only people left in the room are the Bolsheviks. Um, the Mensheviks and the, the SRs and the cadets, they all thought they were doing the right thing by, by turning their back on it and just um, symbolically saying, no, we reject this out of hand. We're not even going to stay and listen to you. Um, but in reality, what that looks like is the Bolsheviks are the only ones left in the room. They have the floor. They have the Congress. Uh, they essentially are the only ones that care enough. And they're, they're the winners is what it looks like to people on the outside. So Congress is held for another couple of hours until 6 a.m., then everybody goes home. They come back later on that day in the 26th of October, uh, 8.40 p.m., and Lenin actually rocks up, makes a speech about all of his promises because we've taken government, there's no one else here, um, and so they, they've just they've admitted defeat and we are the, the true government. Here's what we're going to do. Um, in the meantime, until we get our constituent assembly elections, we're still going to have our elections. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to run our government through our Sovnicom, so our um, Council of People's Commissars. Turns out, though, that all those commissars or representatives are Bolsheviks handpicked by Lenin and his mates. Um, so it's not a great form of democracy, but he at least promises we will have an election. Um, we know that eventually that doesn't happen. They, they don't respect the outcome of that election when the socialist revolutionaries win. Um, the next day on the 27th, they also announced the uh, Soviet Central Executive Committee, so the CEC, um, and that's sort of made up of a mixture of everyone, mostly Bolsheviks. We've got 29 socialist revolutionaries, 6 Mensheviks, and then 62 Bolsheviks. Um, but that's supposed to sort of throw a little bone to the other leftist socialists uh, in the room. Um, so they've announced, we are the government and here's how we're going to run things. We're still pro-democracy and going to have our election, but here's how things are going to run in the meantime. So that's essentially a summary of the three really important components of the October Revolution. We've looked at our causes and our key reasons why it happened, why it was possible at that time, the key processes of um, how it actually happened, who was involved, what happened, when, etc. Um, and lastly, we've looked briefly at some of the consequences, um, but really... These consequences can't all be felt until the coming months. We know that the uh, Bolsheviks don't respect the outcome of the coming Constituent Assembly elections. They dissolve that straight away and say, well, we've already got our Superboy band, the Sovnicom, that we've handpicked. Let's just keep, uh, keep it how it's going. Things are going great. Um, and you really have, as with all revolutions, even though it begins largely uh, with this idea of democracy and representative government, um, the Bolsheviks believe we know what's best, whether you know it or not, and whether you believe it or not, you, the voters, the people, the workers. So we represent you. We were elected by you. Um, but even when you stop loving us, we're going to keep on loving you. Um, so that's how it goes. And so we've looked at the causes of revolution um, and the consequences um, very briefly of this October revolution.